recordings here, is shock and sepsis. So what we're going to do, and we're going to briefly review all the different kinds of shock, but you've had already every kind of shock. We've kind of covered all the different ones except for neurogenic shock by this point. Um, so here's the list of all of the different kinds of shock right now. We talked about cardiogenic shock in uh, when we talked about cardiac. That's acute heart failure is considered cardiogenic shock. Um, it's basically when shock is any time you are not perfusing your tissues. So people are like, what's the defined criteria? What does shock mean? What's the blood pressure for shock? Um, I cannot find a defined criteria for what gives you the word shock. We generally use it to say when you have a sustained blood pressure below 90 that you can't uh, resolve. Um, but again, there's no real defined definition. So most of is, is perfusion deficit. So it means your organs are not being perfused for some reason. Um, and usually lack of perfusion means a low blood pressure. Um, and most end stage shocks are in low blood pressure. Um, so what we're going to talk about are the types of shock, which we've kind of already covered. Um, cardiogenic shock is, again, when the heart is malfunctioning. It's also known as acute heart failure. Um, but when you cannot get your blood pressure or perfusion up because your heart is malfunctioning. Hypovolemic shock, we will talk a little bit about when we do the trauma section, but that's just because you bled out all your fluid. Hypovolemic shock or you're so dehydrated, you can't get a blood pressure. Hypovolemic shock is when fluid is missing from the body. Um, and then there's two other kinds. They're on their own. Cardiogenic shock and hypovolemic shock are on their own. Um, obstructive shock means something is blocking flow through your heart so or your lungs. So there is blockage of flow to your heart. And the things that cause obstructive shock would be anytime your heart is compressed, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumo, pulmonary embolism, these are obstructing blood through your heart. So if you see the word obstructive shock, that means that blood flow is blocked from getting through your heart. And then distributive shock is a perfusion deficit because the vascular system is over dilated. And so flood, blood is not returning to the heart as well as it could be. And fluid is getting diverted into the tissues because of vessel vasodilation. And those happen in septic shock, which we will talk about today. Anaphylactic shock, which you kind of talked about way back in block two when you talked about allergies and anaphylaxis. Uh, when you go into anaphylactic shock, that is a massive immune response that causes vessel vasodilation. Septic shock is also a massive immune response that causes vasodilation. And then neurogenic shock is on its own. Well, it's a, it's a distributed shock, but we will talk about that next unit when we talk about neuro. So I will not test you on anything about neurogenic shock until the neuro lecture. So I'm putting it there because it is a distributive shock. It does cause massive vasodilation, um, but it is due to a spinal cord injury. And we will talk about it under the spinal cord injuries. So I just wanted to show you cardiogenic shock we've already covered. Hypovolemic shock, you don't have fluid, you gotta put fluid back. Obstructive shock, we kind of covered when we talked about the tension pneumo, the cardiac tamponade, you have to remove the pressure from the heart to clear obstructive shock. And distributive shock are the two that are more common and go through all the phases slowly. Cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, obstructive shock, go through all the stages of shock very quickly, and then you end up with the low blood pressure. Um, but what I'm gonna show you is that there are four stages of shock, which you will need to know. Um, the initial stage has no symptoms. So no matter what kind of shock you're in, anaphylactic, septic, cardiogenic, um, we don't see the initial stage of shock, meaning something's happening below the surface. Something's happening, either the heart is starting to fail, you're starting to get an, a, an allergic reaction to something. We're not seeing what's going on beneath the surface. So we never see the initial stage. It's kind of like the, when we're talking about kidney failure, the initiating stage or the risk stage, that's the stage of shock. There are no signs and symptoms of the initial stage at all. Nothing. 
um, other than there is hypoperfusion and cell death happening, but we don't see it yet. We see no signs and symptoms of it. Um, the compensatory phase is the one we're pretty familiar with where we're starting to see symptoms, but they're not that bad yet. So this is kind of going through our, um, our stages. So if I'm going to get my little pictures going here, um, this one we can say has no symptoms. Now, the, how fast you move through these stages depends on the kind of shock you're in. Um, this one has um, the increased, this one has where we see tachycardia, tachypnea, and things are happening under the surface here. So if you are in hypovolemic shock, that's our first, so this is our, um, our cues, and these are worsening. So when we talk about hey, how do you know you have it? Um, technically, a lot of people have the first stages of shock and do not have a low blood pressure. Um, so when you start seeing the low blood pressure, we're already in the worsening phase of shock and we're down in the progressive or irreversible stage. So a lot of times people are in the beginning stages of shock and we treat it there, which is the goal, is to treat shock when it's being compensated by the body. Um, like I said, if you're in hypovolemic shock or you're losing blood, blood spurting out of your leg injury, um, that's going to be, you're going to fly through that compensatory page pretty fast where your blood pressure is stable and you're just having tachycardia and tachypnea um, and you will drop into the progressive or irreversible stage much quicker if you have a spurting arterial wound. Um, if you are having a, um, a heart failure, you live in the compensatory stage of shock. You're always tipping over into, because you already have heart failure, you're living to kick tachypnic and tachycardic, and you're trying to maintain yourself in that compensatory phase. Um, but any illness or distress sends you into worsening cardiac failure. So cardiogenic shock, um, like I said, if you're in acute heart failure, the first time we're going to see it is we see the tachycardia tachypnea. And then as you are unable to maintain your blood pressure, you are considered worsening stages. So are there any questions on these stages of shock? We're going to go through a couple of different slides on them, but just because it's a stage of shock doesn't mean you have a low blood pressure in all the stages. We only have the low blood pressure in the later two stages, in the worsening stages, which is progressive and irreversible. Um, so that's something that confuses a lot of people because they're like, well, if it's a stage of shock, you must have a low blood pressure. Um, I don't think people realize how um, we're in that compensatory phase with most of our illnesses and that if we do not fix things um, they end up getting worse and that's why when we, if you have a worsening cue for a worsening blood pressure or your blood pressure drops then you're pretty much your meeting criteria for a compensatory phase and if your blood pressure drops and maintains low then you are in a progressive or irreversible stage. Um, so we will use these stages when we talk about sepsis, because sepsis is a beautiful picture of you going through all the stages. Um, some of these, like hypovolemic, anaphylactic, um, they're in a compensatory stage for a very short amount of time, and we see them pre presenting in their progressive stage. Um, so anyway, that's where... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I got an annotation request. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work um, with that, so try it again. I accidentally hit decline. Somebody said they wanted to annotate. I'm not sure what that's going to do to the presentation or not because it said I couldn't annotate anymore if I did that. So not sure what happened on that one. I just got that notification popped up on my screen. Um, try and ask for it again, and I can hit accept and uh, see what happens. Um, so anyway, the compensatory stage, like I said, um, and why didn't my, my little notes, did they show up on the screen? My notes aren't showing up on the screen. Oh, there they are. they're showing up. Yeah, they are showing up on the screen. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So let's move on and just kind of look, um, at the cues. So, when we're saying we have existing cues or you're having 
the beginning of a problem. Yes, it could progress to shock. If you're having heart problems, you could, could progress to cardiogenic shock. If you are having bleeding problems, you could progress into hypovolemic shock. Um, if you are having an infection or a immune reaction, maybe a transfusion reaction, maybe a bee sting, you could progress into a uh, distributive shock. And um, if you are having a tamponade or a, a uh, pneumothorax, you could be progressing into um, an obstructive shock. So what we're seeing is the existing cues of the fact that we are possibly entering some kind of shock if we do not fix a problem is tachycardia, tachypnea, um, and what is happening in the background here is impaired tissue perfusion. So your body is sending out signals saying, I'm not getting oxygen. Remember, all of this stuff is, um, is derived from the ox, the body asking for something. So when you're, for whatever reason, whether it's vasodilation, your heart not working, you don't have enough fluid, your tissues are not getting enough blood flow. And so in response to that, um, they start creating energy. They still have to do their jobs. They start creating energy without oxygen. So without blood flow and without oxygen being supplied to the cells, they start creating, they send out messages saying, be harder, breathe faster, and this is in response to decrease O2 levels at the cellular level. So... A O2 sat of 92 is usually what we kind of go for, because if your oxygen is 92% saturated, then you're probably getting enough oxygen out to the tissues. But if your oxygen saturation starts to drop, or maybe you have no drop in your oxygen saturations yet, but if the cells are asking for oxygen, the first signs you're going to see is tachycardia and tachypnea, because that's the cells asking I'm not getting enough oxygen, I need more, do some more. Heart beat faster, breath, you know, let's start breathing more, let's get more oxygen into this system here. So you get tachycardia and tachypnea as a response to decrease O2 levels. Um, weakness or fatigue because the cells don't have enough energy to do their work. And slightly elevated lactic acid levels. Not to the point that it creates a big problem. Our normal lactate level, we do have the pic, we do have a lactate level in there, is less than two. So you can um, actually put yourself at the gym, and you're running on the treadmill, and you're huffing and puffing, and you're doing your intervals, you're doing your high intensity workout. Um, you're going to get tachycardic. You're going to get tachypnic because what are you doing for your muscles? you are making them do more work. So they're asking for more oxygen, so you get tachycardic and tachypnic. Um, what happens to the oxygen that gets all used up? You're asking your muscles to do a lot of work, so your oxygen gets used up. Some of that muscles has to work without oxygen, and they create lactic acid when they create, I don't know if you remember way back in biology, the Krebs cycle, um, but cells make energy using oxygen, and if they don't get oxygen, they make energy anaerobically, which creates lactic acid. Um, so when you work out, you're in a compensatory stage of shock. If you continue to work out to the point that you exhaust yourself and deoxygenate yourself and hypoxia yourself, then you will end up in a worsening stage. You'll end up in... Um, Oh gosh, let's go back and look and see. If you continue to work out madly and don't rest, let's look and see what kind of shock would you put yourself in. I'm thinking, hmm, if you are working out to the point that you become hypoxic and pass out, hmm, I'm trying to decide where I would put that. Any thoughts? I don't think we do that because we would stop before we got to that point. Because if you got so tachycardic and hypoxic that you passed out, your body is trying to protect you from going any further. Um, but I would either call it 
uh, cardiogenic because you make your heart work way too hard and it can't function anymore, or you would end up distributive because you have sweat so much. I'm not sure what we would call it. But if you do not stop working out in this compensatory phase and you keep going into the point where you become acidotic, your heart can't even go anymore, um, and you've worn out your system, I mean, what happens is you could you could pass out. Um, your body is trying to protect itself from going into a worsening phase. Um, so I just kind of, it, you know, not that working out is going to put you into shock. I don't want to use bad terminology there. Um, but it's what your body is doing during acute heart failure, during hypovolemia, during a, an infection or an anaphylaxis, is that the body is working out hard due to some sort of problem there. It's causing the tachycardia and the tachypnea, and eventually this compensatory phase will fall away because you just keep stressing the system. So if we do not fix our problems underneath, um, you'll end up in the worsening cues, which means you're going to progressive or irreversible stage. Um, when the heart and the lungs just can't keep up with this demand anymore, or when your cells have created so much lactate that your body is acidotic, um, you've ended up in the progressive or irreversible stage. And that means that your blood pressure is dropping. Um, you are not perfusing well. You have pale, dusky, cool, clammy skin, diminished pulses, diminished cap refill. Your oxygenation's not that great. You're short of breath. You're confused. You're dizzy. Um, your urine output could be going bad. There's all these worsening cues are signs of decreased perfusion. And so that's why we were worried about that little old man that had pneumonia and was already on oxygen. I'm betting you that little old man with pneumonia in the test question had tachycardia and tachypnic, was probably weak and fatigued, possibly maybe had a slightly elevated lactate level if we had even tested it, um, probably not even elevated above normal, but starting to get up there because he was deoxygenated. And now that little old man that's climbing out of bed and confused is actually showing signs of worsening cues. He's confused. He's disoriented. And that is due to hypoxia. We need to double check this man and say, are you Alzheimer's dementia or are you actually going into a worsening stage of shock? We need to double check the patient, look at his oxygenation, look to see if he's short of breath um, and double check that he's not going into a worsening stage. So what we are looking at here is think of the compensatory stage as, all right, the body's trying to deal with it. Um, it's being asked to do a lot of work but it is managing. And then when it cannot manage anymore, you head into the worsening stages. And then when you're in the irreversible stage, you have multiple organ failures. So now if the little old man climbing out of the bed with dementia, you go and put on his pulse socks and his SATs 88, and you can't get it back up again. Um, now he's got, um, you go all the way up on your oxygen. He's got the pneumonia has taken hold. Um, and he has signs of respiratory failure and um, increased confusion. Once they start having more than one body system involved in decreased perfusion, it is called multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And that would be in the irreversible stage. So what we're going to use is we're going to use sepsis as our... Um, way to see how these stages progress. Um, but this, uh, when we're looking and we're worried that we have either a cardiogenic, a, um, sorry, a hypovolemic, so cardiogenic, hypovolemic, a septic, meaning you have an infection that could be getting worse, um, or an anaphylactic, you're going to be monitoring all body systems for perfusion. Um, because if you're worried about any kind of progress, compensatory or progressive worsening condition and they qualify for shock by having either a bad heart, um, having a risk for coronary or cardiogenic shock, having a risk for hypovolemic shock, maybe they've got a bleed, maybe they've lost a lot of volume, um, if they have a risk for sepsis, if they have a risk for um, maybe they're having an anaphylactic reaction or immune reaction, any of those people that are in a compensatory stage and have this, you're constantly monitoring to make sure they don't go into a worsening stage. Um, and the monitoring is checking each system, 
for adequate perfusion. The neurosystem, the perfusion marker that we're using is level of consciousness and confusion. Um, now, if the patient is baseline confused, it's hard to tell if that system's going bad or not. But on most patients that are awake, alert, oriented, and now are confused, that is a change in your neurosystem. We're going to say that's a change in your neuroperfusion until we're proven otherwise. Um, respiratory, um, check for oxygenation, sign symptoms of hypoxia, cardiovascular, monitor the heart rate, the blood pressure, um, and look at the pulses, the perfusion, the warmth of the skin, um, any edema. Um, for the liver and the GI system, uh, we're going to look for, um, if you're going into liver failure, you're going to have trouble clotting. If you're in acidosis, you're going to have trouble clotting. Um, if you have low bowel sounds or an ileus, um, all these things are decreased perfusion. And then, of course, the kidney, when it's decreased perfused, we start seeing a decreased urine output. Um, so there's a lot of things to look for when we're worried about a patient going into progressive um, you know, or worsening stages of shock. Um, here are some of the things we do lab-wise to monitor shock. Um, if we have any concerns of infection at all, um, blood cultures can be drawn to make sure that you do not have a bloodstream infection, which is sepsis, one of the most common uh, causes of shock. Lactate levels are very important for monitoring what stage and whether you're going into shock or not. If you're in a compensatory phase and you're worried about a progressive phase or maybe our patient um, climbing out of the bed and confused, if he's having a decreased urine output and he's confused and he's got a source of infection, the pneumonia, um, we would want to, we could check his lactate level to see if he's going into a worsening stage of shock. Because if an if the cells are deprived of oxygen, they will create um, energy using an anaerobic cycle, which will create lactate. So if your cells are decreased on oxygen, they will increase their lactate production and your lactic acid will go up. So on an elevated lactic acid is a criteria for um, the progressive or irreversible stage of shock of all kinds. So you can always draw a lactic acid level and check it to see where you are in these stages of shock. Um, ABGs are useful um, as well for checking your oxygenation level. Um, cardiac monitoring for making sure that your heart is not being deperfused. Um, continuous pulse ox, hemodynamic monitoring, possibly usually the CVP is what we're looking for. Um, and again, chest x-ray is kind of at the bottom because pulmonary edema, you'd have to have some kind of pulmonary issue going on. Um, so these are just kind of basic things, but I'm going to point out the two most important ones are going to be if you have any source of infection and you're showing compensatory, they will probably ask you to get a blood culture. They will probably ask you to get a serum lactate, and they will probably be looking at an ABG. Um, so think about when you have a cardiogenic shock patient. If they know your heart has an ejection fraction of 20, and there's no other signs of infection, then you might be able to skip the blood cultures. But they probably get them anyway. If you think about a, um, a heart, you know, a patient in the hospital, they're always getting blood cultures. And the reason is, is we're trying to rule out any kind of bloodstream infection causing symptoms. Um, you may see your patient getting a lactate level um, if they're having any kind of um, blood pressure issues, um, and in the ER they draw the lactate level all the time, to basically categorize, is our patient in a late stage of shock or are they having symptoms of other things? Easy, quick thing to do to make sure that your oxygen, your cells are getting perfused. Increased lactate level means your cells are not getting perfused with oxygen. Um, so it could be due to any of the shock symptoms. You could have an increased lactate. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the first one that we're going to look at here, and um, we're going to look at sepsis. And the correct um, sepsis has very clear criteria of going through all these stages. So that's why we're going to grab it first. And we're actually looking at sepsis. Septic shock is actually the last stage of sepsis. Um, so we do not qualify for septic shock until you're down here in the irreversible stage. 
Um, sepsis means you have an infection in your actual blood that's traveling around in your bloodstream. It means that an infection that you've had in your body, maybe a pneumonia, maybe a kidney infection, maybe a um, GI infection, some infection that was localized is now in your bloodstream. Um, so the first phase of that, we don't see. We don't see the bacteria getting into the bloodstream. Unless you're managing your patient with a microscope, um, you're not going to see septicemia, which means blood leaking into, or bacteria or a virus leaking into your bloodstream. We don't see that stage. So septicemia, we don't see. Um, we just know that the patient has an infection somewhere um, in the body. And so any source of infection, whether it's a surgery, an pneumonia, a kidney infection, um, a lung infection, um, a GI infection, any infection anywhere in the body has a chance to hit septicemia. Um, areas with high capillary counts and lots of perfusion into the blood, so the lungs and the kidney and the liver, infections in those places are the more common ones to become septic because those have a lot of capillaries and their job is to exchange, and GI, sorry, I should say GI. So our most common sources of septicemia are um, respiratory, uh, GI, GU, or kidney, and um, liver. So if you have an infection in any of these four places, they're very common or can quickly move into the bloodstream because there are a lot of capillaries and their job in those organs is to exchange across the membrane. So of course you can exchange bacteria across a membrane. So lung infections, kidney infections, gut infections, and liver infections um, cross into the bloodstream very easily. We don't see that process. Um, the only thing you see for that process is that there is an existing infection in one of those organs, or it could be any organ. I mean, even a, a surgery site can be the site for a sepsis, um, but most commonly it's those four vascular organs. Um, so septicemia, we don't see. No sign symptoms, um, completely asymptomatic. It just means an infection is moving across into the bloodstream. The first thing we see is the compensatory phase. So if you have bacteria in your bloodstream, you are creating a immune response to that bacteria. It's a large immune response because the bacteria is just not localized to your finger, to a wound, um, to one area anymore. This bacteria is now throughout your body, in your bloodstream, and so it's a large systemic immune response. Um, and that's what we see in the compensatory phase, and I have a slide for each one. We're going to see increased respiratory rate and increased heart rate and um, no changes in the blood pressure yet. The body's going to start dealing with this, and what's happening underneath the surface here is that when white blood cells eat bacteria, they kind of, um, you know, to be not very, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, the politically correct term for it. So let's say we have our little Pac-Man white blood cell and it's eating a bacteria. Once it eats the bacteria, it breaks that bacteria into pieces and that white blood cell then releases or poops out um, cytokines. These cytokines, um, and sorry, I can't write very well, but those cytokines bind to the vessel wall and create leaking at the vessel wall. So when the bacteria does this, when you have a hangnail and the bacteria goes over there to clean out your dirty hangnail that you bit your finger and you got a hangnail, then bacteria go there to clean that area up. They release the cytokines as they eat the bacteria, and that opens the vessel, the capillary, and allows fluid and swelling to happen. That's fine at a localized reaction. Um, let's just say this is happening in pneumonia, if this is happening in the lung. Those white blood cells are getting in there, eating bacteria, pooping out the cytokines. The cytokines bind to the capillaries around that infection site in that lung, and fluid leaks into the lung in that one localized area, and that's an appropriate infection response. Here, this is happening in the bloodstream. 
So as the bacteria are eating up, this is like a high-speed police chase going on. So as the bacteria are running around after these, um, I'm sorry, the white blood cells are running around in the bloodstream eating up bacteria, what's happening is that when they poop out these cytokines, they're binding to the vessel walls the way they're supposed to, but they're not localized anymore. They're going on throughout the body. So these cytokines are getting deposited all over your vessel walls throughout your entire body, creating widespread capillary leakage throughout your body. So instead of a localized swelling reaction, you're having a whole body swelling reaction. And that is what is happening during the systemic inflammatory response um, or sepsis is that these bacteria are creating massive vasodilation throughout your body because of a normal process. These cytokines are binding to your blood vessels and your capillaries, but instead of just being localized at your hangnail or at your pneumonia or at your wound site, it is going around throughout your body and creating tissue leaking throughout your body. So what's happening is you're losing blood flow. You're losing fluid out to your tissues because of this leaking immune response. So you are losing fluid out to your tissues, so your actual vessels are becoming dried out. So when your blood vessels dry out, what happens? Your heart rate goes up. You're getting decreased perfusion to your extremities because all the fluid is now in your tissues and now you're getting decreased perfusion to the extremities, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, and the body's trying to get, get um, oxygen out to the cells. The only way to stop this process is to, what do you think? What is the best way to stop this process, to stop this SIRS process from happening? This is white blood cells chasing bacteria throughout our blood vessels. And how do we stop that from happening? Any thoughts? People are like, oh my gosh, this is the interactive part of the lecture. Oh no. What we're going to do in this stage is antibiotics. Yep, antibiotics are going to stop this because it's going to help us kill the bacteria so we don't produce as many cytokines and we stop that leaking process. Um, as you move into the progressive stage, this is where we've seen that now this leaking of fluid from these dilated blood vessels is causing hypovolemia and continued decreasing perfusion. And because we're decreasing perfusion, decreasing perfusion because all of our fluid is leaking out um, and we haven't started antibiotics yet, so this process is still continuing. Now there's more bacteria. They're replicating as they run. And um, now their white blood cells are going and chasing and chasing and chasing. More and more cytokines are getting pooped out. We're getting more and more vasodilation happening, more and more capillary leakage happening. And um, we're losing more and more fluid. And these bacteria just continue to grow. Um, the stages of sepsis, the way you move through them depends on the bacteria depends on the in, um, what is um, infecting you. Bacteria replicate very fast, and um, you'll progress through this very fast. Some people can progress through these stages um, in two to three hours. Some people will take two to three weeks to progress through these stages. It depends on the virus. It depends on your immune system. It depends on the bacteria. It depends on the... Um, on the organism involved. But what is happening is while our blood system is trying to fix things, um, the, the, the culprit organism is replicating in the bloodstream and the white blood cells continually chase it, eat it, poop it out um, and cause uh, blood vessel dilation. So as we head into severe sepsis, this is where it's gone unchecked. We've never started an antibiotic. We've never done anything to help out the immune system. And now what do you think you're going to see in stage three? We're losing a lot of blood volume. I mean, I mean, a lot of fluid out to the tissues. We're getting decreased perfusion. So now we are having more and more vessel dehydration and less perfusion. And so now we are showing up with acidosis because the cells are just going without their oxygen. We are seeing a dry patient. We are seeing an edematous patient. Um, and we're seeing an unchecked infection. So let's go look. And then if you let this continue without any treatment, then it will go into a complete wear out of the immune system um, and organ failure. So let's look at each system in detail.
and there are cues that go with each system. So in your compensatory phase, in SIRS, um, this is where the cytokines are binding to the vessel walls, causing dilation, causing some leaking. Um, you have a source of infection, and usually that source of infection could be anything. It could be um, surgical. It could be um, respiratory. Could be kidney. Um, could be GI. Could be liver. Any kind of infection going on in your body. Any source of infection. So any patient that comes into the hospital um, that you're treating for a respiratory infection, a kidney infection, a GI infection, all those are sources of infection. Um, if they have a fever, so the, you know, a fever. You Now you don't need all of these. You only need two of them. So if you have a source of infection and an increased heart rate, you've already met SIRS sepsis criteria. These are standard criteria um, throughout all hospitals. Um, this is a nationwide standard criteria. In fact, I think they even do these SIRS sepsis criteria worldwide. Um, so a source of infection and either fever, an increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, and an either an increased or super decreased white blood cell count. And um, you can see the increased white blood cell count. Of course, if you're having a replicating infection, you will have an increased white blood cell count, especially if it's in your bloodstream. Those white blood cells are amping up, trying to kill off that um, intruder. But you can also have a super low white blood cell count, and that means that this has been going on for quite some time. We have a, um, quite a few people that show up in the hospital that have been fighting an infection at home for a week or so and just aren't feeling well. And by the time they come into the hospital, they are meeting sepsis criteria. Um, not only do they have a fever, a high heart rate, tachypnea, some acidosis, but their white blood cell count is low. And it's not because they have leukemia or cancer or a problem with their white blood cells. It's because this infection has been going on for so long that their count has dropped because we've used up all the white blood cells and just can't make that many more. There aren't enough mature blood, blood, white blood cells. So either one will get you into the sepsis criteria, a high, high white blood count or a low white blood count. So our normal white blood cells are like around four to 10. So anything less than um, four or 4,000, depending on what units we're using. Um, but a white blood cell count less than four or greater than 10 or 12, um, that's a sign that you could call yourself sepsis. So um, think about how many people in the hospital meet these criteria. Almost every single one um, would meet SERS or sepsis criteria. Does not mean they are having a bloodstream infection. How do we know if they have a bloodstream infection? They meet the criteria. So what do we do as soon as you meet criteria? We're going to notify the provider that they meet the criteria and identify if there's an organism that we need to be fighting that we're not fighting already. As soon as you meet criteria, this is just the sign that there's something going on we need to investigate. Um, and so that's why you see most patients in the hospital meet criteria and we will rule out, is there blood? Is there an infection in the blood? Is there an infection in the respiratory tract? Is there an infection in the kidney tract? Is there an infection in your wound? We're going to identify the organism and do IV antibiotics at that time. Most patients don't wait till they meet criteria. They get prophylactic antibiotics. If you have a wound, a surgery, as long as you're getting antibiotics, you stop sepsis in its tracts. And that is our goal for all patients is to intervene here in the compensatory phase, either with prophylactic antibiotics or antibiotics. Antibiotics stop sepsis. Um, so uh, if you work in the ED, you will see that patients that come in meet sepsis criteria, get drawn all their cultures, and get antibiotics. Um, those antibiotics need to be put in within one to three hours, and that's actually a criteria for accreditation of a hospital, is how they recognize and treat potential sepsis patients. Um, and that is with the goal of keeping them in the compensatory phase, helping out the body before they progress. So let's say your patient maybe stays home through their compensatory phase. 
Maybe they're just trying to fight off that flu bug and they don't know it is sepsis. They don't know they're meeting the, um, the SERS criteria. They're not getting help. They've had a flu bug for a long time. They probably have a walking pneumonia, but they just can't shake this, um, this fatigue, this exhaustion. Um, they're not feeling that great. Their heart rate's racing. Um, they've had a fever for a couple of days. Um, and they've never gone in to see anybody. Um, and we don't see them in the compensatory phase. Sometimes we see them when they're coming in in the progressive stage. So the progressive stage, you don't lose any of your criteria. Your criteria still exist. Fever, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, white blood cell count, high or low. But now you have signs of hypotension, ineffective tissue perfusion, and now your lactate level is starting to climb. So in the progressive stage, you have your SERS sepsis criteria plus a low blood pressure, ineffective tissue perfusion, and a higher lactate level. Do we do anything different in this stage? One difference because of the low blood pressure, which you guys are all primed from that test question, you all recognize a lower blood pressure, a higher heart rate, fluid bolus. That patient with pneumonia, um, question like that might come back and now is even more. I wanted to see how many of you were on the page prioritization wise. You guys were all treating progressive sepsis in that question and you didn't even know it. Um, what you're doing is when your patient presents to you with a low blood pressure, tachycardia, tachypnea, fever, a source of infection, you're going to do all the things that you would do for the progressive state or for the compensatory phase, which is identify the organism and IV antibiotics but you're also gonna add a fluid bolus to it. And because you have a low blood pressure and lactate, we need to get some fluid in the system. In a septic patient, a patient with a bloodstream infection, they have massive vasodilation happening in their capillaries, they're losing fluid to their tissues, let's put fluid back in the bloodstream. The standard fluid bolus for a sepsis patient is 300 milliliters per kilogram, so that's up to two to three liters. And some of you may say, oh, well he's got pneumonia, I don't wanna give him fluid. If they meet sepsis criteria, you give them fluid. They have a, um, a high, high risk of having this massive vessel vasodilation. We need to fill the vessels to get an adequate blood pressure <clears throat> until we can get that vasodilation to stop by stopping the bacterial infection. So the only thing you're gonna do in the progressive stage, and you're in the progressive stage when you have a low blood pressure, is give fluid. Um, everything else is exactly the same. Identify the organism and IV antibiotics. We see this happening all the time on the floor of the hospital um, where the patient meets SERS criteria. They're trying to reach the doctor. Um, the doctor hasn't called them back yet, and now their blood pressure starts to drop. <coughs> so we're allowed to give them the fluid bolus that is required um, if you call a CRT. Um, fluid bolus to get fluid to fill the vessels. Um, and you can get blood cultures, sputum cultures, urine cultures, you pan culture the patient and then get them antibiotics. Now with the CRT, we can't order antibiotics, but we can get you the fluid bolus, the cultures, and get a call to the doc to get a proper antibiotic based on the source of the infection. Um, if this is effective, then you stop sepsis here in the progressive stage and your everything gets better with the fluid bolus. Um, if this is progressing, then when you give the fluid bolus, their blood pressure does not get better and um, their lactate levels don't improve and they're heading into the irreversible stage. And the irreversible stage is the one that gets you the ICU bed. Um, none of the other stages of sepsis, you can manage those out on the floor because you're just giving IV antibiotics, um, making sure the cultures are making sure the culture is done, giving IV antibiotics and fluid if necessary. Um, the irreversible stage is where you have your SERS criteria plus persistent hypotension, meaning even after fluid, you are still hypotensive with a blood pressure less than 90 um, and multiple organ dysfunction signs. 
um, your lactate level is still greater than four, and now you're starting to show a metabolic acidosis. So the lactate level being high doesn't automatically put you in an acidosis, but as it gets worse, you do start heading into a metabolic acidosis. So if we start seeing multiple organ dysfunction, persistent hypotension, and a metabolic acidosis, then you get to buy your ICU bed. And what do we do to treat our ICU patients? Um, we're going to continue to make sure they have tissue perfusion. So whatever oxygen is needed. So you'll follow your respiratory failure because truly this is a system in failure. Um, you will increase oxygen up to 100%, then move on to BiPAP, CPAP, and then onto mechanical ventilation if you need it. So all of the respiratory failure treatments we will do. Uh, maximize perfusion to the organs. So again, more fluids, a lot of fluids, um, 30 milliliters per kilogram, um, albumin, anything we can do to fill the vessels. And because this is a massive vasodilation problem, um, you will do something to constrict the vessels. The massive vasodilation is not helping anybody. It's a, it's a systemic immune response. And what we're going to do is counteract it with vasopressors, something that is going to squeeze the blood vessel down. And um, we'll use norepinephrine, epinephrine, or phenylephrine, our vasoconstrictor. Actually, this should say vasoconstrictors. Uh, the vasopressors is a old term. These are actually technically vasoconstrictors. So you'd want vasoconstrictors. Inotropes will help your heart function, um, but again, we need to worry about whether they're going to get worn out or not. Um, so I would probably, if I had to order these, I would do fluids first, then vasoconstrictors, then CVP monitoring, and then inotropes if we need that on top of that. Because the vasoconstrictors are going to help us um, squeeze down those blood vessels that are dilating that we don't want dilating. Um, so why do you think, what is CVP monitoring going to tell us? We learned about it in the cardiac thing. Why do we do CVP monitoring? And why are we doing it in fact, let me reorder this again. Sorry about that. Let me order this again. So this is constrictors. Now that I look at this. I'm going to give fluids first because we need to replace fluid in the blood vessels that has leaked out. We're going to do the CVP monitoring second to evaluate when the vessels are full. So when we have tanked them up, remember our CVP goes anywhere from zero, meaning you're completely empty, to above 12, meaning you're starting to get overloaded. So what do you think we would want our vessels to sit at CVP wise before we start constricting the vessels? How do we know they're full? What value will tell us CVP wise, if we're monitoring the CVP, that our vessels are full. Any thoughts? So 4 to 12 is normal. We like to get the CVP up to around 10. We want that vessel to be pretty full, okay? Because before we start squeezing, we need to make sure. It is fluid filled so that when you start squeezing that vessel, we're actually squeezing it down onto a fluid filled vessel. If you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze an empty vessel, it doesn't give you a blood pressure. You have to have a full tank before you can squeeze down on that uh, blood vessel. So we're going to make sure that our CVP is up before we start squeezing the vessel. Otherwise, we're squeezing an empty tube and you don't get anything out of an empty tube. Um, and then if we still need more support after that, we can stress the heart a little bit more. But usually filling the tank and getting those vessels constricted so the heart doesn't have to pump so hard to fill a big sewer pipe um, does help the heart rate. So what we do is we'll do fluids first, fill the tank, um, get that CVP up, and then we start vasoconstrictors to negate the dilation. Then we'll add inotropes with it. Um, to help the heart beat if we need it. Um, but remember, most in sepsis, the heart is not the problem. 
the heart is usually pretty healthy. Um, again, we will decide things based on the patient's um, comorbidities, but most septic patients have a pretty healthy heart aren't in heart failure. If your patient's in heart failure, we may need to kick those inotropes in a little sooner um, to get to get the heart functioning with this. So you can imagine how difficult this is to manage on a patient that's already in heart failure and now is bloodstream infected with sepsis. You got two kinds of shock fighting each other there and you have to do the treatments for both kinds of shock. Um, but fluids first, Get that CVP on to make sure that you are fluid filled and then start your vasoconstrictors. Um, so that's making sure that our cardiac system and our vessels are working in tandem that we counteract that Im Im immune response of vasodilation. Um, of course, treat the infection, uh, prevent further infections, provide support, and we'll do supportive measures for individual failing organs. So if our organs are failing, which I think is on the next slide, we'll, we'll see. Oh, this is the surviving sepsis campaign where, um, this is just my evidence-based piece, um, where a lot of these, these are, um, the surviving sepsis campaign is nationwide, um, and I think worldwide campaign, um, and where the guidelines are for, for doing our sepsis interventions. Oh, I don't think I have my, I had a... I had my mods thing. Um, when your patient, I thought I was going to put, I thought I put this slide at the end of the irreversible stage. Um, but when we're supporting organ failures in organ systems in failure, um, of course, we're going to be doing oxygenation. We're going to be treating sepsis with fluids and vasoconstrictors and antibiotics. But what we're going to be doing is supporting each system as we need to. Um, so respiratory failure patients could be BiPAP, could be ventilated. Um, cardiac failure patients could be on inotropes, um, could be on antiarrhythmic stuff. Um, neurological failure, we might sedate them. We might try to decrease the brain activity so that they're not as stressed and trying to consume um, energy um, if they're already confused. Um, renal failure, they can go and they end up on dialysis. Um, liver failure, we support um, by giving blood products, any failing liver, you'll end up with clotting disorders. Um, we adjust rates of medications for liver failure patients. And GI failure patients, there used to be no um, real intervention for GI patients. So this is, I should put this slide at the very end, um, but I'm going to add this kind of slide. This would be for irreversible stage. I'm just going to kind of add this, and you can move it if you want. Irreversible. I can't spell. Stage management. So the things that we can do are um, BiPAP, mechanical ventilation, And this is really all we're doing is managing um, systems until the infection can get under control. Um, cardiac failure, we'll do inotropes. Um, and um, dysrhythmia treatments. Um, neurological failure, we can do um, sedation, safety. Um, restraints if needed. Um, but again, this is basically, this patient is not functioning on all cylinders because they're deprived of oxygen and they are not getting enough blood flow to the brain, um, mostly safety f um, with that. Um, with renal failure, they'll end up on dialysis. Uh, with liver failure, we will replace... Um, blood products. The liver is the only one we don't have like a dialysis machi a machine for. Um, replace blood products, adjust med doses. And for GI failure, we used to have no interventions for GI failure. And when your GI was deperfused and not getting enough oxygen, um, you'll end up with pieces of necrotic bowel. 
but now they can, um, they're doing something called um, direct peritoneal resuscitation. Resuscitation. It's still kind of new. Um, there's not a lot of um, articles on it, so you may see it. But a lot of patients, we would just kind of let them go into GI failure. Like, sorry, we don't have anything for it. Um, and you'd end up with having a lot of bowel issues uh, during sepsis. And so now what they've seen to do, they started doing it in trauma patients, um, is that they bathe the... Um, the GI system, they don't, they don't do a peritoneal dialysis. They just kind of bathe it in a protective solution um, that helps vasodilate out the GI uh, vessels and keeps it perfused. Um, again, I'm not going to test you on it, but it's, it's a pretty new um, thing that has very good effects. But we basically manage the multiple organ failure. And what we're doing is making sure that the patient gets um, the best perfusion to the organs that they can, um, that we keep their blood pressure up, that we keep their fluid filled, and that we keep blood flow to the organs the best that we can so that they can recover from this infection. Um, but you can see that there is a 40 to 60% mortality on, um, on irreversible stage sepsis because there's so many organs in failure. So the whole goal of sepsis, but sepsis is a beautiful picture of seeing you walk through the stages of shock, um, through the initial phase, to the compensatory phase, to the progressive phase, to the irreversible stage. Um, so sepsis is a beautiful picture of it. Um, the rest of them, um, so we can kind of put that, I, I will try to see if I can move that annotated slide to the end there. I meant to put that mod slide there at the end. Um, for cardiogenic shock, again, this is just a review um, to make sure that you remember that basically any signs and symptoms of shock, so the existing cues or the worsening cues, plus a source of injury to the heart is going to classify you for cardiogenic shock. Um, and the best treatments for those, again, just what we studied back in the cardiac lecture, inotropes to help the heart squeeze, preload and afterload reduction, and assist devices if you need it. Hypovolemic shock, um, we'll talk about this is basically a volume loss, bleeding, um, over product, you know, over de dehydration. Um, hypovolemic shock is loss of intravascular fluid volume. You lost me? Can't hear me? So hypovolemic shock is where you have lost either blood volume or, um, or fluid volume. So you could be massively dehydrated and be in hypovolemic shock. You could have a massive bleed and be in hypovolemic shock. This is locks of volume. Um, so this one moves through very quickly, the stages of shock. Um, when we are looking at um, the cardiogenic shock, that most of our patients in cardiac failure live in the compensatory phase. They're hardly ever in the initial phase, which is where the heart gets injured. They're in the compensatory phase most of their life, and they're always in danger of kind of tipping into the progressive or worsening phase um, with any kind of infection or anything like that. Um, hypovolemic shock, you move through real fast because you're losing your blood volume. Um, so they're moving through the blood volume. They start showing signs of decreased blood pressure, tachycardia. In the pro They show progressive stage signs very quickly, um, but they should respond to getting fluid volume. And once you restore the circulating volume, you never progress any further beyond the progressive stage. Um, this one's pretty easy to spot and treat. Um, you've lost volume, give the volume back. Uh, most patients from hypovolemic shock, unless they're in hypovolemic shock for long periods of time, so you're maybe your dehydrated patient that's now in renal failure, that would be considered... Um, if they're in another stage, if they have more than two systems, so if they're maybe had um, anoxic changes to their brain and they're um, in renal failure, uh, that could be considered progressive stage of hypovolemic, or uh, sorry, irreversible stage of hypovolemic shock if they were that dehydrated for that long. Um, but usually it's pretty well quickly recognized and quickly fixed. Um, can you have more than one type of shock at the same time? Like septic and hypo, oh, 100%. Uh, you've got the difficult, uh, you're ready to be the ICU nurse when you can handle multiple different kinds of shock at the same time. Um, 
the cardiac uh, or the cardiac failure patient is our most common one. Uh, the patient with congestive heart failure who has been living in that compensatory phase for a long time and now gets a pneumonia. Um, they can get septic and they've already got a bad heart on top of it. So we have <clears throat> patients in heart failure and sepsis all the time. Um, yes, you can have sepsis and hypovolemia. They kind of go together because you're losing blood volume out to the tissues. So yes, it can be considered septic and hypovolemic at the same time. Uh, we end up with cardiac, cardiogenic shock and um, septic shock all the time. Um, they can, you can have two at once. Um, it just complicates your interventions, and you have to make sure the interventions for all the shocks are being handled. Um, anaphylactic shock, you probably have to go all the way back to your um, to your memories of block four, um, that basically a recent exposure to an allergen, so this would also be a blood transfusion reaction, um, you know, a, a a new med that you have an allergic reaction to, um, a bee sting, a, um, you know, any kind of allergic reaction. This one um, has the stages of shock plus angioedema wheezing strider, um, but the immune response causes the massive vasodilation and the hypotension. So you get the allergic reaction plus the widespread SIRS criteria. Um, and this one you would intervene with airway support um, epi will do exactly what we treat it for, what we're doing it for in sepsis. It's causing vasoconstriction and helping your heart pump through the anaphylactic shock, um, immunosuppressants, because basically this shock is coming from a massive immune response, not due to a bacteria, but due to an allergen. So we want to suppress that system. Um, with sepsis shock, it's due to a, an actual physical um, infection and we wanna treat that infection. So um, with anaphylactic shock, our first interventions, of course, are always going to be airway. Um, epi will support our massive vasodilation, hypotension problems going on, and immunosuppressants. So epi and immunosuppressants kind of go together because epi will fix the cardiac problems going on and the vessel problems going on, but it's not gonna stop the actual immune response. So they have to be given together and then fluid replacement to replace what leaked out during vasodilation. So in distributive shock, we're always giving fluid. Um, distributive shock are um, sepsis patients, um, anaphylactic shock patients, when you see neurogenic shock. In distributive shock, we have massive vasodilation and loss of fluid, so we give fluid in distributive shock. In obstructive shock, we kind of hold off on the fluid because our problem is with flow through the heart. So adding more fluid to the scenario is not going to help the problem. But in distributive shock, we do give fluid. Um, and then neurogenic shock, again, I put it here um, that you can refer back to it on the next unit. Um, this one causes um, hypotension and bradycardia because our nerves are um, not working. But we will, we will talk about neurogenic shock um, during, during the neuro lecture. And then here, this is the last slide. This is my, this patient is a perfect ICU, irreversible shock. Every other organ is outside of the bed on this patient. Um, so I just love this picture because I'm like, oh, look at these. Look at this patient. Do you know what bed that is? Do you recognize the bed? This is the rotoprone bed. So this patient, yes, it's a rotoprone bed. It turns, it kind of rotates back and forth. Um, it keeps them prone facing the floor, but it can um, rotate from side to side up to a full 90 degree angle. So we are basically keeping this patient kind of face down so that we're oxygenating, but it turns side to side and keeps mobilizing secretions. Um, so this patient is in obvious respiratory failure. If they've bought the rotoprone bed, they're in respiratory failure. Um, has mechanical ventilation. Somewhere in that menagerie of junk is a ventilator. Um, so ventilated respiratory failure. Uh, I am sure there is some neurologic failure there or some sedation to treat the neurologic um, lack of perfusion going on there. Um, so we got the rotoprone bed. I don't know where the ventilator sits in this room here. Um, this patient is actually on um, ECMO. 
and that's probably um, going, that's probably half of what this ventilator is. Um, I can tell because you've got the, um, this big uh, blood tubing there going to all the stuff here on the pump, and then there's an extra pump in the back there. That is actually ECMO, which is extracorporeal oxygenation. Um, that is where they, it's not dialysis where they're filtering blood, but they're physically exchanging oxygen for your lungs, where your lungs are so bad that we can't even trust your lungs to oxygenate blood. And that is kind of the last ditch effort to save somebody who is in such bad respiratory failure. Um, there's only a certain number of centers that do ECMO. I do believe, I think Mayo and St. Joe's are only two in Phoenix that do ECMO. I don't know if University downtown, Banner University does ECMO yet. Um, but ECMO is where you remove all the blood that's returning to the heart and send it through a bypass machine. You're physically kind of doing cardiopulmonary bypass at the bedside. Um, and they're exchanging it. Um, oh, they are not. Oh, my God. If Chandler starts doing that, I'm going to scream. Um, I, I don't doubt that they want to. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to go on with that, but if Chandler's going to be doing ECMO soon, um, that will be very interesting. But it is basically bypass at the bedside. So this patient is in severe, severe, severe um, respiratory failure, cardiac failure as well, because we are bypassing uh, cardiac and doing full on cardiac bypass at the bedside. Um, so this patient is in massive failure. The machine in the front here is a uh, dialysis machine. Um, that one is doing continuous renal replacement dialysis, which is a form of dialysis that we do when the patient is too unstable to have a liter or two removed from the regular dialysis machine. Because um, remember, if you remember back to block three, dialysis itself pulls about two to three liters off a patient within three hours. Um, most unstable patients cannot handle losing that much fluid at once. So they put them on continuous renal replacement therapy, which will just filter the, um, the blood and either not take fluid off or take off very small amounts of fluid. So this patient's already on dialysis over there. Um, you can see the tube feeding over here. We've got some nutritional support going on. And then look at all these chest tubes. This patient is probably a post um, cardiac patient that's ended up with respiratory failure as well, just because I can imagine all the chest tubes there. I'm not sure what's happening in the background of the picture, just trying to figure it out. But um, if this is scary, do not, <laughs> do not head to the ICU just right away, um, because you do um, end up taking care of patients where we control almost everything on the patient because their bodies just cannot any longer. They're in multiple organ system failure. So I think this picture is just a beautiful picture of what multiple system organ failure does look like. And um, it makes me miss the bedside. <laughs> so on that note, I will let you go. And um, I do believe it is late for lunch. So let's go and